How's it going everybody? Texas Man here. I hope you guys are all having a fabulous day. Give this video a thumbs up if you guys really enjoy it. Subscribe if you guys haven't already. Also do me the biggest favor of all. Hit the bell notification button and select all for all notifications. You guys don't miss out on future videos or streams here on my channel. Also make sure to head over to Twitch, friend, and follow me there at Douglas447 with a capital D. It's got a Detective Pikachu picture icon. Again, that's at Twitch at Douglas447 with a capital D. And of course, we are continuing on reading through my book series. This is going to be part one of the Chronicles of Uniform 9, The Raiders of Space. If you guys haven't had a chance to watch any of my past Uniform book series books, read-throughs, and uh, of course, Delta Horse, um, make sure you guys go ahead and do that. They are in a playlist on my channel, so make sure you guys check out the playlist so you guys can get all caught up. If you guys want a copy of this book, to read on your own time or to read with me, let me know in the comments section. Uh, you're going to have to give me your email. I will send you a Microsoft Word document version of the book for you guys to be able to read in your own time or with me if you guys are interested in that. And uh, with that, I hope you guys enjoy the book. Introduction. The war against evil continues as Unit 4 returns to Yon 4, only to be mind-controlled by Nikolai's generals, the Raiders. The struggle will be capturing the Raiders before Nikolai receives the Golden Lightsaber. The team will also venture into No Man's Land, but may remain trapped there when their ship's engine explodes. Can the team retrieve the Golden Lightsaber and escape No Man's Land? Find out. Chapter 1. The Raiders' Swamp Cave Location. Sector 14. West of Comforting, the DAAS-44 ship. Douglas, we will arrive back at Yon 4 in 10 hours, said Devon, driving the DAS 44. Unit 4 had just left No Man's Land because of the surprise visit from Nikolai Sith, but Ash Becca had the chance to warn them all. Ash, is your left hand doing better now? asked General Douglas Armstrong, leader of both Unit 4 and the Corps, yet under the command of God. Take a good look at my left hand, said Ash, revealing it to Douglas. The hand was still the color black after Nikolai touched it on thin line. Let me go get the ruby, said Douglas. Don't, Douglas. I have it, and I've been trying to cure it. But the fact that a part of Nikolai's soul is in me is keeping my hand this way, said Ash. Do you know what this means, asked Douglas? Yes. Yes, I do. Sadly, I do, said Ash. Location. Somewhere in Sector 20, Nikolai's arms ship. Is it about time you four arrived, said Nikolai, to four humans that were carrying blaster rifles. My lord, we had to secure the moon for the portal to hell, said one of the humans. You are my generals, but now I need you to become raiders and steal something for me, said Nikolai. What can we do to serve you, my lord? asked a female human. Tet Art, Philip Farm, Paul Roberts, and Sarah Mark, go to Yon 4 and retrieve this item for me, said Nikolai showing a piece of paper with a lightsaber on it. Location, Yon 4. General Ultimate, the DAS-44 is entering our atmosphere, said General Abbey of Cassando. Within three minutes, the DAS-44 landed. Unit 4 and Ash entered Unit 4's base and thought about Toll Ray Williams back on thin line. I wonder which won the lightsaber duel, said Dave. Neither one of us, said Ray, inside of the base. Ray, you're alive! But what about Nikolai, said Deborah. I couldn't kill him, so I just teleported to Earth 2 and waited for you to arrive here to inform you that I was okay, said Ray. Are you going to stay? asked Dave. Not for much longer. I must return to Thin Line and wait for... Well, oh, never mind, said Ray, keeping a secret about the future to himself and teleporting away. Yeah, Ray's just a jerk. He, he can see the future and he can't tell people it's going to happen because it would break the timeline continuity. And the universe would kind of come to a collapse. So, yeah, he's an overpowered person, but I have to limit what he can actually do, which is irritating as a writer. Uh, page 4. General Douglas, Unifor and Ash Becca, welcome back to the base, said General Ultimate, entering Unifor's base. It's great to see you too, General, said Douglas, shaking his hand. Do you have the ruby? asked the General. Yes, it is in a secure location, replied Devon. Where exactly? asked Ultimate. What's the rush? asked Douglas. Give me the ruby and your lightsaber, 
Or else, said the general to Devon, pointing two blast rifles at Unifor and Ash. No, replied Devon. Just before the general pulled the trigger on the blasters, Douglas charged towards him, teleported him to a prison cell on Yonfor, and returned to Unifor's base. I don't know what's going on, but it doesn't feel right, said Dave. You're correct, Dad, and it is strange that Ultimate was so eager. It is almost like he was being mind-controlled, said Douglas. Sorry to break up this conversation, but we had these four humans inside of our base of operations, yet no one has seen them ever before, said General Abbey of Cassando. Where are they? asked Douglas. General Abbey entered the base, and the four humans followed. Make your names known to us and state your side, said Douglas. We are called the Raiders. I am Ted Art, and these are my friends, Philip Farm, Paul Roberts, and Sarah Mark, said Ted. While Ted was giving information, Philip was using a strange device called a retro groove on Douglas. General Abbey, you don't need to worry. These are my friends, said Douglas. They are not. They are armed spies, said Ash. Take them to the prison cell to General to join General Ultimate, said Douglas, to General, to General Abbey. Give us a place to sleep and bring us the lightsaber at midnight tonight, said Philip, softly speaking into the retro groove, which was sending very tiny blue circles into Douglas's body. Devon, find our guest a place to sleep and food to eat, said Douglas. Devon escorted the raiders to a shelter and ordered them food. You two are to stay away from me tonight. Understood, said Douglas to his parents in a rude tone. Sure thing, replied Deborah and Dave. Douglas left the base, but his parents stayed. I don't like this. Whatever happened to Ultimate, I think is happening to Douglas, said Dave. Dave, look, said Deborah, pointing at the retro groove in Philip's right hand. I think those raiders are here to raid us of something, said Dave. What is a retro groove, asked Deborah. I'm not sure what that device was, but if it was a retro groove, and for what is going on, my guess is that it is a close ranged mind controlling device said Dave. Close range mind controlling device, said Dave. The General Ultimate and Douglas are being mind controlled, asked Deborah. Yes, answered Dave. Location, the prison cell. General Abbey, listen to me. I know that Douglas is being mind controlled by the Raiders. You have to let me go so I can stop them, said Ash. No, Ash. Enjoy your companion, said General Abbey to Ash, showing Ultimate already in the cell. Tell me something, Abby. Are you being mind-controlled by the Raiders? said Ash. I wouldn't know if I was, replied Abby. Abby, if you don't release me and the General, the Raiders will succeed in getting their hands on whatever it is they want, said Ash. That's the plan, and my lord Nikolai Sif's command, said Abby. Two hours later, nearly midnight. The Corps was mostly asleep, but Douglas had awakened taking the golden lightsaber from the armory inside of Unifor's base, and began walking towards an unusual ship. Mom and Dad, wake up! The plan is a go, said Devon, already suited up with blast rifles and a lightsaber. Let's teach these arm raiders that the Corps doesn't enjoy battling... I'm sorry, that the Corps doesn't enjoy being controlled, said Dave. The Unifor members watched as Douglas gave the raiders' leader, Ted Art, the golden lightsaber. Good luck, and I hope you enjoy the ride back to the arm base on your ship, the B-6. The, sorry, the, B, yeah, the BC-96, said Douglas to Ted. The Raiders boarded the BC-96 and left Yan-4. Move in, said Devin. The uniform members surrounded Douglas. Where am I? Why are you three pointing blast rifles at me, asked Douglas. You have been mind-controlled, said Deborah. By whom, may I ask, said Douglas. They called themselves the Raiders, and their names are Ted, Philip, Paul, and Sarah, said Dave. What did they raid from us? asked Douglas. They didn't raid us of anything. You were mind-controlled, and they used you to raid my lightsaber for them, said Devon. This is very bad, said Douglas. During your mind-controlling state, you sent Ultimate and Ash to prison, said Dave. Unifor raced to the prison and freed their friends. It would appear that that retro groove could no longer control Douglas, Ultimate, or Abby once the Raiders left the planet on the BC-96, said Dave. What is a retro groove? asked Ultimate. It is a short-range mind-controlling device that fires tiny blue circles into the body and allows the person with the device to speak into it and control the other person, said Douglas. How would you know so much about this device? asked Ultimate. I built it and left it on Earth-2 during the victory in the Space Mageddon battle. It must, have been, it must have survived the planet's annihilation 
afterwards, and the last war against Satan, said Douglas. Then, once the planet was reformed, these raiders just knew where it was, said Abby? No. I think Nikolai was told by his father, Satan, before his defeat, and Nikolai sent them to retrieve it, said Douglas. The question is, where are they going? Why did they take the golden lightsaber? And who are they really? said Devon. Douglas, you talked to them more than I did. Did they tell you anything about them or their plans, said General Ultimate? No, but I did wish them good luck to the arms base planet, said Douglas. Which planet? asked Elra. It doesn't matter. I placed a tracker on the BC-96 before I returned from the shelter to the base. The ship is on an autopilot course for the planet Kun in Sector 13, said Devon, with a hand device. Do we need masks, and what is its terrain, asked Douglas. No mask required, and the planet's terrain is that of a swamp, like thin line, said Devon. General Ultimate, we are leaving, and will return soon with the Golden Lightsaber, said Douglas. Unifor boarded the DAS-44, left Yan-4, and began the course toward the planet Kun. Location. Edge of Sector 13, one hour from Khan, the BC-96. Ted, I have some terrible news. Someone placed a tracker on the ship and is monitoring our every move, said Philip. I know this. It is all part of the plan, said Ted. What plan? asked Paul. Instead, they are following us into a trap. I'm sorry. The Corps believes that we are leading them to the arms base of operations. Instead, they are following us into a trap, said Devon. What trap? asked Sarah. Our lord, Nikolai Sith, with the golden lightsaber in his hands, said Ted. Location. DA, uh, D the DAAS-44. Douglas, we have just entered Sector 11 and will arrive at Kun in two hours, said Devon. Let us hope that we are not too late to stop these raiders' plans and discover their true identity, said Douglas. Two hours later. Douglas, we arrived... Sorry, Douglas, we have entered Kun's atmosphere, and we are now hovering towards the signal of the tracker on the BC-96, said Devon. Devon, go low. I see a raider with a missile launcher, said Douglas. Devon disengaged the idle drive system and lowered the DAAS-44. Kaboom! The raider had fired a missile at the DAAS-44. System status, said Douglas in his command chair on the bridge to Dave. Shields are at 96%, said Dave. Mom, get our weapons ready. We are going to be in close combat with the enemy, said Douglas. Douglas, I'm landing the ship now, said Devon. Stay close together and watch these others' backs. Remember that most creatures have never visited this planet. So, we don't know for sure what is on this planet, said Douglas to the rest of Unifor, leaving the command bridge and walking towards the door to exit the ship. Devon, press the button, said Douglas. Devon pressed the button on the door, and the door opened. Don't move, or else we're all dead, said Douglas to Unifor. Which were, scared, which were scared out of their minds to see two gigantic crocodiles by the doorway. The crocodiles moved onwards, and Unifor continued towards the BC-96, using Douglas's 20LC. My readings are showing that the BC-96 is inside of a cave about four clicks southeast of our current position, said Douglas. I wish we had the Ark 70 armored jeep right now, said Devon. So do I, said Deborah. I wish I could teleport to Troy, Dad, but the fact of the matter is is that the ARC-170 is no longer usable, said Douglas. I have something strange on the 20LC, said Douglas. Douglas, you already told us where the BC-96 is, said Dave. It's not the BC-96. The object is moving towards us, and fast, said Douglas. Weapons green, said Devin. Unifor pointed their blaster rifles at the direction the object was coming, but could not see anything moving. 20 seconds until it is on top of us, said Douglas, looking at the 20LC. Where is this thing? asked Debra. This object is not only fast, but huge, said Douglas, looking at the 20LC again. How much time is left until it reaches us? asked Dave. It is right on top of us, said Douglas. The team went back to back, not knowing where the object was. This thing must be broken, said Douglas, separating from the team. Zoom! A creature picked Douglas up and slammed him alongside a tree. Open fire, said Dave. The creature roared at the team members who were shooting their blaster rifles at him, and within five seconds flew away. Douglas, are you okay, asked Deborah, with a concerned mother tone. Yes, I'm okay, but man, that was one of the biggest vampires I have ever seen in my entire life, said Douglas. I'm sorry, did you say that we just got attacked by a vampire, asked Dave. Correct, this planet must be full of them. 
He must have been in the trees where we couldn't see him, said Douglas. Come on, guys. The Raider Swamp Cape is not far away, said Devon. Location. Inside of the cave. Ted, I was able to shoot at the DAS-44, but I'm afraid they were able to activate their ship's shields just in time, said Paul. They will be on their way soon, and when they do, the five of us will be ready to put an end to them all, said Ted, with Nikolai behind him and his armed ship being cloaked from radar, such as the 20LC. My lord, this is yours, said Ted to Nikolai, giving him the gold lightsaber. Very soon we will put an end to all four of them, and then the core will be next, said Nikolai. Ten minutes later. We made it, said Douglas. The team looked to see a metal door as part of a mountain. Looks like the Raiders made a base, much like the one on Yon 4 for the X3, said Devin. Well, let's punch in the code and enter, said Dave. You can do that and waste our time. Or we can just use the 96 RP-30, a very rare weapon that causes its target to turn into dust, and move on, said Evan, preparing to, preparing to fire a 96 RP-30 at the door. Kaboom! Once the light dust settled, I'm sorry, once the light dust cloud cleared, the team looked to see the metal door gone. Yet, inside of the cave stood the raiders with the cover of boxes pointing blast rifles at Unit 4. Find coverage and engage them, said Douglas. Kill them all, said Ted. Unifor raced to the sides of the cave's entrance and began blasting at the enemy. Ted, we can't hold them much longer. They have a 96 RP-30 that they can use. They have a 96 RP-30 that they can use against us, said Paul. I can't use the retro groove on them. They aren't in range, said Phil. They are aiming the 96... The 90, I can't talk like this. They are aiming the 96 RP-30 at us, said Sarah. Fall back to the BC-96, said Ted. The Raiders opened a door, revealing the BC-96. Devin, use the 96 RP-30 on their ship so they can't escape, said Douglas. Devin lifted the heavy rocket launcher, aimed, fired, and turned the BC-96 into dust. The Raiders looked at Unifor, but with a smile on their faces. Prepare the ship for us to depart, said Nikolai, uncloaking the armed ship. Surrender now, Nikolai, and give my brother back the golden lightsaber, said Douglas. No, the golden lightsaber is mine, said Nikolai, turning on the lightsaber. Devon, stay back, said Douglas, while he turned on his green lightsaber, and his parents, their purple and blue. Nikolai charged towards the team and began the lightsaber battle. Suddenly, the ground began to shake, signaling that the raiders were nearly finished preparing the armed ship to leave. Very soon, my generals and I will leave this planet along with your heads on sticks to show the core that you have fallen, said Nikolai. Ted, Paul, Philip, and Sarah, are your generals, asked Devon. Yes, answered Nikolai. Nikolai broke out of the battle with the three members, charged towards Devon, pointed the end of the golden lightsaber at Devon's heart, and just before the lightsaber pierced Devon's body, the golden lightsaber shut off. What shocked everyone, including the raiders on the armed ship's command bridge, was that the golden lightsaber fell out of Nikolai's hand, and moved into Devon's hand. Devon looked at his team members, then the golden lightsaber, and finally at Nikolai. Devon prepared to battle Nikolai, but Nikolai turned into black smoke and entered the armed ship. Devon, fire the 96 RP-30 and we can end this war right now, said Douglas. Devon picked up the launcher, only to realize it was out of shells. Another day, said Dave to Douglas, which was angry that they were so close to destroying Nikolai and ending the war against evil. Unifor watched as the armed ship began its course to place to some place south of the planet Kun. Let's return to Yon 4 and report our mission success of retrieving the golden lightsaber to the generals and Ash Becca, said Douglas, leading the way to the DAAS 44. Chapter 2 Supernova Spiders. Location Yon 4, Sector 7. General Ultimate, how are you doing since your mind-controlled incident against... Um, let's try that again. General Ultimate, how are you doing since your mind-controlling incident, asked Douglas, both inside of Unifor's base, along with the other team members and Ash Becca. Fine, but did you retrieve the Golden Lightsaber, find out who the Raiders are, and kill them, asked the Generals. Here is the Lightsaber, and we found out that the Raiders are Nikolai's Generals, but Nikolai was waiting for us. So no, we didn't kill them, said Devin. 
No matter. I'll send core forces to search the universe to kill them all, said the general. Well, if that is the case, then we will also join the search, said Douglas. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, but you can't. God needs you to escort these scientists to no man's land, said Ash, entering the base. What? What? No! We need to hunt down and kill Nikolai and his generals, said Douglas. This is not a request. It is an order from God, said Ultimate. Okay, where are they, and what is the mission, asked Douglas. Vic Victor, Timothy, and Brittany Lewis sent a ship into no man's land hours ago to explore new planets. The problem is that the crew hasn't reported in since they left, said Ultimate. Go get them ready for departing. We, we leave in one hour, said Douglas. General Ultimate and Ash Becca left Unifor's base, but before Ash left, Douglas asked him about his hand. Is your hand still black, asked Douglas. Yes, and it is spreading, answered Ash. Ash left the base, and, and the Lewises entered. Unifor shook hands with the scientist, introduced themselves, and boarded the DAS-44. The DAAS Location, the command bridge. Unifor took their certain seats and began the usual procedures to take off. Where are we going to sit, asked Victor to Douglas. Oh, sorry. We don't have guests on our ship, but you guys can sit over there on those benches behind me, said Douglas to Victor, Timothy, and Brittany. While Brittany sat down, Devin watched her and smiled at her. Brittany smiled back, signaling that she liked Devin. Taking off in four, three, two, well, mark, said Devin. The DAAS-44 left Jan 4 and began the journey to the solid wall. We will arrive at the solid wall in 10 hours, said Dave, out loud, looking at Douglas. Devin pressed a button on his chair, and his chair turned around, allowing Douglas to be eye-to-eye -eye with the three scientists. I want to know everything. What is the ship's name? Why would you want to explore no man's land during a war against Nikolai and the arm? And why did God even allow you to make such a request? Um, sorry guys, we'll be right back. There we go, I lost my spot. <clears throat> the ship is called the, the Pen Greed, and the reason we sent the ship into No Man's Land was to explore any life forms that wanted to help us against the arm, said Victor. God thought it would be good to increase our numbers and allies before Nikolai turned them to his side, said Brittany. What is the Pen Green's Ped Pen Greed Greed What is the Pen Greed's cargo? asked Douglas. Nothing. Just a crew of 30 men with blast rifles and science equipment, said Timothy. Nothing else, asked Douglas. Timothy looked at Victor. Positive, said Victor. Thank you. Devin, show our guests to their room, said Douglas. Just one minute. I need to put the DAAS... I need to put the DAAS-44 on autopilot, said Devin, pressing a few buttons on his screen in front of him. Okay, please follow me, said Devin leaving the command bridge, along with Victor, Timothy, and his crush, Brittany. Is it just me, or does Devin have a little crush on Brittany, asked Douglas to his parents. Maybe, but just leave him alone, said Dave. Here's your room, Victor and Timothy. I'm sorry, here's your room, Victor, and Timothy, your room is right across the hallway. Brittany, please follow me, said Devin. Timothy entered his room, but Victor watched closely as Devin and Brittany turned a corner. Victor closed his bedroom door and followed Devin and Brittany to another bedroom. This is your room, and if you need help to find something or get somewhere, just knock on the door across the hall, which is my room, or press this button and speak into the microphone. The entire ship will hear anyone that uses it, said Devin to Brittany. Thank you, said Brittany, before entering her room. Devin turned around to see Victor standing with an angry face. This is from, this is from my brother and me. You had better be careful with my sister's heart, because if you tear it apart, Tim and I will kill you. Understand, said Victor to Devin. Understood, and don't be so tense. Remember that I haven't said I like her, or I want to go on a date with her, said Devin. True, but your actions are speaking louder than words, said Victor. Devin entered his room, and Victor walked towards his room. Ten hours later. All unit four members to the command bridge, said Douglas, using the speaker system already on the command bridge. 
What's up, Douglas? asked Devin, entering the command bridge along with Dave and Deborah. We have arrived at the solid wall, said Douglas. Dave, Devin, and Deborah sat in their certain chairs and prepared to activate the energy engines. What are energy engines? asked Brittany, entering the command bridge with Victor and Timothy behind her. Devin turned his chair around to see Brittany and told her that energy engines allow ships to teleport from place to place. Devin, activate the energy engines, said Douglas. Devin turned his chair towards the computer screen and pressed a button. Teleportation in 20 seconds, said Devin. You three may want to strap yourselves in over there on those benches, said Douglas. Don't forget to have a trash bucket ready. Unless you're used to this, you'll get sick, said Dave. Teleportion in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, said Devin. The DAAS-44 vanished from the common part of the universe and entered no man's land. System check, said Douglas. I am here, and all life systems are okay, said Devin. Are you guys okay, asked Douglas, to the three scientists, which were having their mouths in a trash bucket. We're just fine. We've never been better, said Victor. Hey, guys, we have a problem, said Deborah, looking out of the glass window. <clears throat> Unifor and the scientists looked to see Thin Line on the left, and four unknown planets in front of them, and the pen greed between two of them. Systems have just named the four planets the following. Coney Bone, MSD-33, Panru, and DSR-29, said Dave. Hey, said Deborah. What's wrong, Mom? asked Douglas. Oh, never mind. Devin, activate regular engines and get us quickly to the Pen Greed, said Douglas. The Team of Seven was being pulled into Panru, and the reason being was that Panru was a supernova planet. If you don't move this ship fast, that sun's going to eat us like a donut to a human stomach, said Timothy. I'm trying, but the engines can't resist the planet's gravitational pull, said Devin. Dad, fire four hydrogen missiles at the planet, said Douglas. Everyone looked at Douglas with an odd look. Okay. Firing four hydrogen missiles at Panru, said Dave, pressing a red button. Impact in five, four, three, two, one, said Dave. The missiles vanished from the team's sight. And then, small ripples came out of Panru. The DAAS-44 began to shake around, and suddenly a bright light came from the planet and blinded the team. Four seconds later, the light disappeared, and the team looked at where Panru was and froze. Just... What? What just happened? asked Brittany to Devin. Devin, where is the planet? asked Douglas. The supernova planet had vanished from where it was. I have scanned the entire universe. The planet Panru is no longer registered on the universal map, said Devin. Good job, Douglas. You destroyed a sun with four hydrogen missiles, said Victor. Drop it, Victor. At least he saved our lives, said Brittany. Devin, plot a course for the pen and greed, said Douglas. Four minutes later. The DAAS-44 was in visible range of the pen and greed, which was, which was between the empty space where Panru once was and the planet DSR-29. Mom, patch me through to the pen greed, said Douglas to Devin. I'm sorry, said Douglas to Deborah. Go ahead, said Deborah, after pressing a couple buttons. This is General, this is General Douglas Armstrong of the Corps, captain of the DAAS-44 and leader of Unit 4. Please come in, said Douglas. I'm receiving no life signs on board. But there are bodies, said Devin. Oxygen levels are normal, said Dave. I'll try again. This is General Douglas Armstrong. Please come in, said Douglas. Well, now what, asked Victor. Now we board the ship and find out why no one is answering me, said Douglas. Wait! Wait! Wait a minute! We're not boarding a ship with no life signs, said Victor to Douglas. Listen to me, Victor. You three wanted to find out what happened to the 30 men on that ship and have protection. I plan to complete both of those tasks, and if going on board the Pen Greed is the only way, then that is what is going to happen, said Douglas, after leaving his command chair and speaking face to face with Victor. Douglas sat down in his command chair and watched as Devon docked the DAAS 44 with the Pen Greed. Let's suit up and find the crew, said Douglas, leaving the command bridge. One minute later, Devin had finished docking the DAAS-44 with the Pen Greed, and the team of seven waited for the door to open to board the ship. Everybody, keep your blast rifles ready. 
We have no idea what has happened, said Douglas. The door opened, and the team entered the interior of the ship. Anything on the 20LC, asked Victor, to Douglas. Yes, I am receiving thousands of signals coming from inside of the ship, said Douglas. Let me see that thing, said Victor, looking at the hands devices screen. How is that possible? Where are... How is that possible when there are only a crew of 30, asked Timothy. There is only one conclusion. Something else is on board, said Dave. Let's split up into two teams and find the crew. Devin, you take Brittany and Timothy. Victor, you come with me and my parents, said Douglas. If something goes wrong, call us on your earpiece, said Dave. The two teams split up with Douglas's team leading towards... I'm sorry, with Douglas's team heading towards the command bridge while Devon's team began searching the cargo hold. Douglas, you asked me if the pen greed was carrying anything in its cargo hold and I told you no, said Victor. Yes. Go on, said Douglas. Well, I lied to you, said Victor. The team of four paused for an unusual sound was being heard. Douglas looked up to see blood dripping from the body of one of the crew members on the ceiling in the spider web. The other three people followed Douglas's eyes and Deborah began to feel ill. Douglas looked at Victor with a question and an angry like face. What was the pen greed cargo? asked Douglas to Victor. Average spiders that shoot blue acid out of their mouth to burn their victims. We called them supernova spiders. They came from the planet Dismander and were being studied for the possibility of developing a new weapon that Nikolai would not have, said Victor. So that's one more reason God wanted this ship to be found. To capture a spider to be brought back to life for study. I am right. I'm sorry, am I right, said Douglas? Yes, answered Victor. Team 2. Did Victor give you a hard time last night, asked Brit Brittany to Devin. <laughs> yes, answered Devin. Don't worry about him. I like you, said Brittany, giving Devin a kiss on the lips. Hey, you two lovebirds need to come here. Looks like I found eight of the crew, said Timothy, looking inside of the cargo hold. Timothy, behind you, said Dave. Said, De said Dave. Said Devin. Timothy turned around to see dozens of supernova spiders and then had his head eaten off by one of them. No! exclaimed Brittany. Run! yelled Devin. Devin and Brittany dashed out of the cargo hold area and began to search for the other team. Team one. Look, we have found the command bridge, said Deborah. The team entered and saw the Pengreed's captain sitting in his command chair with burn marks on his chest and his head not connected but on the floor. Dad, see if you can find any videos about the Pengreed's crew before they all died, said Douglas. Dave began to search the computer files while Devon and Deborah, I'm sorry, while Devon and Brittany entered the command bridge. Where is Timothy? asked Victor. Our little supernova spider friends took his head off of his body, said Brittany. We have to move fast. Those spiders were right behind us, said Devon. Dad, anything, asked Douglas. Nothing much. It would seem that these spiders have damaged the records, said Dave. Victor, I'm sorry, but you won't be studying these things anymore. Let's get back to the DAAS-44, said Douglas, leaving the command bridge. Douglas, behind you, yelled Devon. Douglas turned around, quickly turned on his green lightsaber, and threw it at a supernova spider, taking its head off. Douglas took his lightsaber out of the spider's body and looked at his friends. Let's get out of here, said Douglas. The team of six dashed out of the command bridge and headed towards the DAAS-44 while being followed by dozens of supernova spiders. Keep going and do not look back, said Dave. Devin, get them to the DAAS-44. I'll hold them off, said Douglas. Douglas loaded his blaster rifle and began blasting the supernova spiders while Devin opened the door to enter the ship. Within four seconds, Devin opened the door, allowing his parents, his girlfriend, and Victor to enter while telling Douglas to run towards him. Get the DAS-44 undocked, said Douglas to his brother. Whoa. Whoa. Almost had an electrical power outage. Backing up, I'm sorry. Get the DAS-44 undocked, said Douglas to his brother. But what about you, asked Devin. Devin, get out of here. I'll teleport, said Douglas. Devin closed the door, ran to the command bridge, and undocked the DAS-44 from the pen greed. 
Douglas, we are undocked. It's time to get out of there, said Dave on his earpiece. Douglas teleported off of the pen greed and to his command chair on the DAAS-44. Devin, get us close to the planet DSR-29, and Dad, prepare to destroy that ship, said Douglas. You're going to destroy a perfectly good ship, said Victor? It is only good for killing things on board. I will not allow the pen greed's cargo to have the chance of killing more people, said Douglas. All right, guys, I'm going to end the video here right now. Uh, I'll see you guys in part two coming out very soon. I want to keep reading, but I think I'm about to have a power outage because of the storm outside. So I apologize. I mean, this video is already going on 35, 36 minutes. So I think that's a long enough video. Part two will be out very soon. You guys have a good one.